works that all stories retold are based on ancient texts called the Bhagavad Puranas, Puranic story. Uh, these are stories that are told to children and uh, people uh, at home are very familiar with some of the icons that you see in them. The first picture you see there I call Sita. Now these are all my own interpretations and the Bhagavad Quran uh, allows for that because they are like open-ended myths, just like the, the myth of Oedipus as you know from the Greek mythologies and playwrights, painters, writers have used those myths in various periods of time to suit their own purposes and to reflect the social situation of that time. So the first picture you see there is called Sita. Sita was the wife of Ram from the story of the Ramayana. Ram was an avatar of Vishnu. Now in the Bhagavad Puranas, uh, what you see, what you, what you read or you hear is about the several avatars of Vishnu who were born at various times to save the earth on the one hand, to save uh, mankind from various evils that was, uh, 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 that attacked them. Uh, and uh, at one period, uh, the uh, avatar of Vishnu called Ram was born and he married a woman called Sita who was brought from the earth. So she is the child of the earth, hence what you see are um, images of different animals and a uh, branch of a tree uh, which connects her to nature and uh, to the earth and to the environment. She was a foundling, she was found uh, as her father was plowing the fields and when he found her, he named her Sita which means plow. And she, when she uh, dies, she also is uh, absorbed by the earth. Uh, in the story of the Ramayana, uh, Ram and Sita are supposed to be uh, uh, a very idealized couple. Uh, and uh, they, Sita is abducted by a demon named Ravan, who is from Sri Lanka. And, he's take, and she's taken away to Sri Lanka. Uh, and Ram harnesses a whole army of monkeys and bears. And then they fly to Sri Lanka to uh, rescue Sita from the clutches of Ravan. Uh, and she has to go through a trial by fire to, pure, to show uh, that she is a pure woman and has not been touched by Ravan. Now, the reason why I say this to you is because some of these ideas still exist in the popular culture of India. And you see this even in the Bollywood films, that the woman has to be pure, that she is only for one man, that, and in fact in Hinduism, uh, the, 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 the life of the wife, or rather the life of a widow, comes to a complete standstill uh, after the death of her husband. She is to wear only white, no ornamentation, no mark on her forehead, no cosmetics whatsoever. Uh, so that kind of purity is expected from women and is even now expected in certain areas and in certain communities. So Sita is the uh, personification of pure woman. Um, and for me it's best even now to showcase these things because of uh, various uh, aspects of our own communities. Uh, the second picture you see there is uh, of two of the avatars of Vishnu. One is Varaha, the, the, the boar-headed god who uh, is trying to save the earth from uh, the demon who is going to inundate it with floods. The, the, the demon you see below the image of the boar is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is the demon who creates floods. Now above that you see Krishna also fighting uh, a demon. Uh, now Krishna was a later avatar uh, sometime in the middle ages and there is a whole Krishna cult uh, and there are many sec sections of Hindu society that believe in the Krishna cult. The wife of Krishna was Rukmini but he also had a lover who was older than him. Now this in a sense goes against the grain of the uh, piety of women and the purity of the wife. 
that is what Hinduism is about, full of all sorts of contradictions. So what we have here is the ecstasy of Radha, who was the lover of Krishna. She was already married, so this was a married woman who uh, con consorted with Krishna outside, uh, you know, it was, it was in a sense not allowed, but in one sense it was also allowed because Krishna was a god. So if, 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 uh, if the sect, in the Krishna sect, everybody is considered a female or a Radha and Krishna is the only male. So in that sense, this kind of erotic love is even allowed. So here you have uh, the ecstasy of Radha and when you come close to it, you see a lot of things happening. Uh, what I have also tried to do, uh, uh, this is only one layer, but the Bhagavad Puran story is one layer. There is yet another layer which has to do with all the violence that we have been going through lately in India, especially in the state of Gujarat on the western side of India. And here uh, uh, the Hindu fundamentalists are trying to fix these stories to make Edens out of it. Almost, uh, as we say in India, they make the Talibanization of Hinduism. Uh, so that, you know, as we know, that most religious fundamentalism and religious bigotry rides its edicts on the bodies of women. And it is they who have to start wearing the veil. It is they who have to start walking behind their husbands. And it is almost to say that it is the woman who then symbolizes that religion for the man. And uh, so when you look at some of these pictures, there's a second layering in it which has to do with that kind of fundamentalism and also to do with the kind of violence that the Hindu fundamentalists perpetuated on the Muslim communities. Uh, and this minority Muslim community was almost eradicated by the violence of the Hindu fundamentalists. Because uh, it, uh, the Hindu, uh, the, the extreme Hindu uh, Mobs believe that uh, Islam or the Muslim rulers that came to India about 500 uh, years ago uh, were colonized India in their own way and they are still suffering from that kind of complex of being colonized by Muslims. But the Muslims we have today are not rulers, they are really the most impoverished communities that we have. So, in, in all these pictures, you will see waves of violence which you have to understand uh, really a way of bringing in uh, to the forefront those images under the guise of the Bhagavad. So it's a kind of a strategy on my part to bring that in. Um, if I spoke about this openly today in Bombay, I would probably censor. This image is a, for me a very strange image. Uh, on the Bhagavad, in one sense, also um, foregrounds the uh, uh, movement of the Aryans which, who came in 2500 BC and the, Aryan, and the Aryans came from Central Europe. But what they did when they entered India was to uh, colonize the uh, indigenous population which was Dravidian and uh, they, they had a way of doing that through the caste system by creating four different castes. What they did was, they said the indigenous people are from the lowest caste and they themselves, the Aryans, would be from the upper castes. Uh, the, that is the, uh, um, uh, uh, the farming community and the warrior community, and the Brahmins, the priest community, would be from the uh, invaders, the Aryans, and the lowest of the lower caste would be that of the Shudras or the untouchables or the indigenous people. Now to do that, they, what they did, to do that smoothly without creating violence, what they did was they absorbed the indigenous gods and they tried to marry their own gods with the indigenous gods. And one such marriage was that between Vishnu and Shiva, but how to marry two male gods. They made an avatar of Vishnu into a female, Mohini, who means a very beautiful woman. Mohini means beautiful woman. And she seduced Shiva a Dravidian god, and the two marry and produce a child called Ayapa, who is even today highly revered in the south of India. There are many, many temples of god Ayapa. So this was a strategy by the Aryans to colonize the local Dravidians and bring them into the fold of Hinduism. In fact, even Buddha is considered an avatar of Vishnu, and 
the, the priest class, or the priests, or the Brahmins were very successful in, in uh, uh, one thing, exporting in, uh, Buddhism altogether out of the country into other parts of South Asia, Southeast Asia. And themselves, they changed the whole character of Buddhism from being a religion that believed in the equality of the human race into, again, the avatar of Vishnu. And that, again, was sort of a strategy laid out by the Brahmins in the Hindu caste system. The Buddhism was a threat to Hinduism, as was later Sikhism and Islam, because all these other religions believe in equality, and Hinduism does not. So here you see Mohini, and I, what I tried to do is uh, make a composite figure of a male female. Uh, and below that you see a Brahma, who, uh, uh, who is on the lotus on the left. Now Brahma was born from the navel of Vishnu. Vishnu lies on a snake with the hood of the snake covering him. There's very, very beautiful sculptures in India of this image. And he lies there for eons of time. Eons and one blink of an eyelid of Vishnu is like one million years. So you, time and space has a totally different consequence in the Hindu mythology. And from his navel is, is this, uh, is this uh, lotus that flowers out and on the lotus is Brahma. And he sits there and does a lot of mischief out there. <laughs> so there is Brahma. Um, and again, there are lots of cross-references to the violence and uh, things that have happened lately in uh, Gujarat. This last image is that of Putana, uh, a female, a demoness, who was sent by uh, a demon called Kauts, who is the uncle of Krishna. Uh, this uncle, who is a king of an area called Mathura, in the north of India, he had been told by Oracle that he would be killed by his nephew Krishna. So what he did was that uh, whatever progeny was born to his sister, he would have them killed. But this particular baby was taken away from his own parents and sent to a foster home. So the, the demon counts never did know that the child had been born and that he still lived. But then he finds out that the child lives and he sent this demoness Putana as a witness for the baby Krishna. But she had poisoned her breasts so that he would die after he sucked milk from her. But what he does is he sucks her completely dry. It's a very vicious image. And she dies as a result. So this is, uh, this is an image of What I've tried to do is show uh, uh, there's four images of female as we find in the Bhagavad Purans. One is Sita, the, uh, the, the, uh, the perfect lover or wife of Ram, and Radha, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the adulteress, so to speak, but completely sanctioned by the Bhagavad. Uh, an older woman uh, who has an affair with Krishna, then Mohini, who is actually a male, uh, and Putana, the demoness. So this, this is the configuration that I wanted to work with in this series. I am essentially a painter, and you will see that in the video installation as well, I have an, uh, a section which is an animation, which is a drawn animation, which ties up the image of the mushroom cloud, uh, along with that of other aspects of that particular central image. Um, so you have remembering Toba Teksing on the right where again there is a drawing element. On the left is the shadow play of the sick profane. A little bit about the material I have used. Uh, it is, this is a modern material out of the modern age called mylar, uh, polyester film which is often used for overhead projection. And I use it like glass. And I work on it in the rivers like glass painting. Uh, glass painting came to India around the 15th century. It was brought to India, to the south of India by Chinese traders. They it was brought like little picture postcards, little pieces of glass with pornographic imagery. They were sold on the, on the harbour to people. 
I quote the imagination of the, of the painters of the region, and the Indian painters adopted that technique to make religious work of gods and goddesses. So the, the, the profane became sacred. And I would like to work on that access of the sacred and the profane. And so this work is called Sacred and the Profane. And there as well, there are images that reflect from the Bhagavad Quran and the image of the couple um, in uh, making love is that of Ram and Sita. Now again, if I were to show today these images, and I have shown them at home in Bombay, but I cannot call it Ram and Sita anymore because again the, uh, the Hindu right uh, want to, to, in some sense to eradicate that element of Hinduism that has to do with erotic. So uh, I, I cannot call it Ram and I cannot call it Sita and I can't call these pictures either by the names that I have given them here. So I continue to call the stories we told and hope that people who see the images will recognize them for what they are. Uh, the shadow play is uh, such that if you walk in front of the cylinders or even across from the lights, uh, you become part of the shadow. And you notice that there are different strengths to shadows. The, uh, if you stand in front of the lights, within yourself, within the body of your person, the shadows will move up and down and will get more intense if you walk in front. So I do like that aspect of interactive in this work. In uh, remembering Toba Tech Sings is on the right, uh, which is a much more complex work and was done in 1998 after the underground testing had taken place uh, on 11th of May 1998, uh, is, uh, uh, is based on a short story called Toba Tech Sing by uh, an, uh, a writer named Sadat Hasan Manto who lived in India up to 1958 and then moved to Karachi. Um, uh, everybody on the subcontinent knows this writer and knows this particular work, Tova Deng Singh. The story goes that a few years after the partition of the two countries, um, the inmates of a mental home, uh, which was situated on the other side of Pakistan, had to be repatriated. That is, the Hindus, the Sikhs, the Christians, and the Anglo Indians had to move to India, and the Muslims would stay on uh, in Pakistan. Uh, the inmates of the mental home had no clue that this was going to happen to them, and when it was announced, many of them said, Well, all this while I thought I was living in India, now where is it gone? And another person said, well, I don't want to go to either of these two countries. I just want to climb a tree. And that's where I want to live. And this kind of thing went on. Uh, there was one particular person, Bisham Singh, who was a Sikh and had to be moved. He was from a uh, village called Toba Tek Singh. And he kept asking the guards, where is Toba Tek Singh? In India or Pakistan? So the guards said, well, we think it's still in Pakistan, but don't worry, we'll bring it to you in India. So they just to, you know, humor him a little bit. So, but he wasn't, of course, satisfied. And when the time came to bus all, all the inmates to the border, uh, this man refused to move. And he stood at the border. As he was a quiet person, nobody bothered him until sundown, and he had to be lifted and brought onto the truck to be sent across. As he was being lifted, he fell over and died on no man's land. So the story is very, very poignant. At the same time, there's a lot of black humor in it. And the fact is that I think these people of the mental home were more sane than a lot of the people who are constantly fostering this huge amount of hostility between the two countries. I think those are the ones who are really insane. Those are the ones who are really creating this huge hostility and piling, stockpiling all these arms and ammunition and uh, doing the nuclear tests and so on. Whereas they should be fighting only one cause, and that is the cause against poverty. Because both countries suffer from a huge amount of poverty. But they are not looking at that problem at all. They are only destroying each other. So the work that you see in uh, Remembering Toba Jain Singh uh, is inspired by the short story. But what you will see 
on the two sides, on the left and the right projections are, are two women, one from India, one from Pakistan, trying to fold a sari across a room of eight meters, but they failed to do so. And um, the reason why I used two women to do this act was because um, I, I, I have the feeling that most decisions of world are made by, mainly by men, and it is women finally who have to bear the brunt or the result of those actions, whether it's to make a war or whether it is to do this kind of nuclear testing. Finally, the, the mishaps that take place, the people that are hurt, the children that are born deformed, these are then nurtured and cared for only by the women. And they are there left to take care of the wounded after wars are um, we uh, uh, ravage countries. So, uh, so in this incantatory way, they continue to fold the sari, almost in a catatonic. Their gaze is almost catatonic, you know. But they have to keep doing it because that is what is finally left to be done. And the main wall, you see the projection of the mushroom clouds and the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki with my animation. What you see in the trunks, that I want people to read like the page of a book uh, from left to right, up to down, as one would read in Hindi as well as in English. The first monitor that you see in the trunks is of um, the division of the two countries, India and Pakistan. Now this was done by a man who was uh, Cyril Radcliffe and he knew very little about the geography, the politics or the social structure of the land. And Hence, he was chosen by the British, as, he, as the British thought he would be objective to speak. And so there he was with his pen, and he made this wonderful line that divided the two countries, not realizing that 300,000 people would die as a result. What happened was, there was a huge stampede on both sides, trying to enter each of these countries, which finally they found, you know, was uh, no more there. And what you see is the riots from 47. And then you see the riots from 1992 and 93, soon after a very historical site was destroyed by the Hindu fundamentalists, a 16th century mosque uh, called the Babri Masjid in the north of India was uh, completely destroyed. And what, uh, what happened in Bombay was a bloodbath of the worst kind ever since partition. Um, there was one spate of violence in the December, in December 92 and then January. Uh, so you see images of that in the third monitor. And the fourth monitor, I wanted to show that this is not only a problem that we have in India, but also a similar problem existed in Bosnia, Serbia, and Croatia, where again, different communities who had lived together in harmony all these years suddenly decided that they were each other's enemies. The second row of trucks has victims from Japan, from Hiroshima, Nagasaki, bomb explosion, and then also victims from India, who are from recent times, from the various nuclear power stations where the groundwater has got contaminated and children are being born deformed, without legs sometimes, without ears, distorted teeth. And then you have an image of a US naval officer making the shape of the mushroom cloud as if it were a beautiful woman. Makes the shape like that. Uh, you see this gesture, it's a very, very vulgar gesture. The third uh, trunk has an image of an Indian baby being born, but is then goes back into the womb as the mother does not want to give birth to a baby in the world like this. And then you see the birth of a Dutch baby, a white baby being born, and baby goes back into the womb. The last set of trucks have uh, monitors with blue, uh, uh, azure blue sky with fleecy white clouds. The air has no boundaries and if uh, India or Pakistan ever make that decision of throwing the bomb, then both countries would be completely destroyed. And it's, it's not possible that, and of course it will affect many other parts of the world not going to be confined only to your neighbor. And so I decided that finally it's important to say that whatever you can divide the earth, but you cannot divide the sky, and you cannot divide air.
So that is what remembering Toba takes is about. Thank you very much. <laughs>